In a world where diplomatic niceties often mask harsh realities, a seismic shift is occurring in West Africa. Imagine a United Nations assembly where, instead of rehearsed platitudes, raw truths echo through the halls of power. This isn't fiction. It's the new reality spearheaded by Burkina Faso. But what drove this nation to break ranks? What truths were laid bare? And how will this audacious move reshape the global order? Prepare for a journey through a diplomatic minefield where we'll uncover the hidden motives behind international interventions, expose the hypocrisy of global powers, and witness the birth of a new African resistance. From the exploitation of natural resources to the manipulation of terrorist threats, no stone will be left unturned. As we delve into this groundbreaking speech, ask yourself, are we witnessing the dawn of a new era in African leadership? And what consequences await those who dare to challenge the status quo? For decades, African leaders have been criticized for their reluctance to speak candidly on global platforms. The United Nations General Assembly has often been a stage for carefully scripted performances, with leaders seemingly more concerned with pleasing international donors than addressing the true needs of their people. But a wind of change is blowing across West Africa. And at its center stands Burkina Faso. Under the leadership of President Ibrahim Traore, Burkina Faso has emerged as a beacon of fearless leadership. Unlike their predecessors, who may have cowered at the prospect of losing international support, Burkina Faso's current leaders speak from a place of deep conviction. They challenge global powers on issues of justice, equality, and the treatment of African nations with a boldness that has been sorely lacking. This shift was starkly evident at a recent United Nations General Assembly. While many African leaders delivered speeches that failed to make a significant impact, Burkina Faso's representative, Basol Mabasi, Minister of State and Minister of Civil Service, took the podium and delivered a message that would reverberate around the world. For nearly 30 minutes, Bazi fearlessly addressed the injustices that Africa has long endured at the hands of Western powers. His speech was a direct and unapologetic critique of the unequal power dynamics and the exploitation of African resources. It laid bare the frustration and disillusionment many African nations feel toward the West's often hypocritical stance on issues like democracy, development aid, and human rights. Bazi opened his address with a series of powerful quotes, each emphasizing critical global issues. He painted a vivid picture of a world turned upside down, where bodies litter the beaches where billionaires bask. This stark imagery highlighted the moral disconnect in the global socio-economic system and set the tone for the hard truths that would follow. Bazi didn't mince words when addressing the international community's response to crises in Africa. He pointed to the recent catastrophic flooding in Libya, criticizing the hollow expressions of solidarity from world leaders. But he went further, arguing that true solidarity would involve acknowledging the complicity of nations in Libya's current turmoil. The minister traced Libya's chaos back to the 2011 NATO intervention, which he described as a man-made disaster. He boldly stated that this intervention, driven by Western imperialism, led to the assassination of Colonel Muammar Gaddafi and plunged Libya into ongoing conflict. In a move that surely raised eyebrows, Bazi demanded that the international community owe the Libyan people a sincere apology. But Libya was just the beginning. Bazi turned his attention to Niger, warning that it could become another Libya. He accused the UN of hypocrisy, pointing to the exclusion of Niger's legitimate leaders from the General Assembly. This, he argued, was a result of external interference and manipulation by imperialist powers. In a passionate appeal, Bezi called on the people of Africa to unite against imperialist forces seeking to control and exploit the continent. He urged nations to resist the agenda aimed at humiliating and subjugating Africa. But how realistic is this call for unity in a continent often divided by external influences? Bazi's speech took an unexpected turn when he drew parallels between the conflict in Ukraine and the fight against terrorism in the Sahel region. He suggested that some powers, particularly in the West, are deliberately fueling the war in Ukraine by providing military support. Yet when it comes to countries like Burkina Faso, Mali, and Niger fighting against terrorist incursions, support from the international community is often lacking. The minister highlighted a stark contrast. While 58,000 volunteers in Burkina Faso have mobilized to defend their homeland, some African leaders label these patriots as militias. This revelation raises questions about the true nature of international alliances and the motivations behind foreign interventions in Africa. Bazi didn't hold back in his criticism of international efforts to combat terrorism in the Sahel. He pointed out that while countries like Burkina Faso, Mali, and Niger have pooled their resources to fight terrorism, France imposed the G5 Sahel Force. This force, in Bezi's view, 
was more an instrument of control than genuine support. The disparity in funding for different initiatives was another point of contention. Basie revealed that while only $25 million was allocated to the G5 Sahel, a staggering $2 billion was pledged for a new intervention force aimed at re-establishing democracies. This stark difference in resource allocation led Bazzi to question whether the international community truly values human life equally across the globe. In a scathing critique, Bazzi accused France, the former colonial power, of meddling in Burkina Faso's internal affairs. He claimed that France, through its African proxies, attempted to install a prime minister and other key officials in Burkina Faso's government. These efforts, according to Bazi, were thwarted thanks to the resolve of leaders like Captain Ibrahim Traoré. The minister also highlighted the challenges Burkina Faso faces in obtaining military equipment due to blockades imposed by Western countries, particularly France. He cited an example of air defense equipment that was supposed to be supplied by Brazil, Belgium, the US, and Canada, but was cynically blocked. This revelation raises serious questions about the true nature of international cooperation in the fight against terrorism. Addressing accusations from Western media about the presence of the Wagner Group in Burkina Faso, Bazi dismissed these claims. He emphasized that Burkina Faso's defense and security forces, not external actors, are responsible for defending the country. But in a world of complex geopolitical alliances, can such assertions be taken at face value? Bazi's speech took a dramatic turn when he addressed the presence of foreign soldiers in the Sahel. He pointed out that around 10,000 troops, mostly French, but also American, German, and Italian, are stationed in the region. These forces, equipped with advanced military and surveillance technologies, have failed to stop the movements of terrorist groups wreaking havoc across Mali, Nigeria, Burkina, Faso, and other countries. The minister posed a provocative question. Who is truly responsible for arming, feeding, and training these terrorists, given that none of the countries in the Sahel produce weapons? This question challenges the narrative of Western involvement being based on goodwill and raises suspicions about hidden agendas. Bazi argued that the real motive behind the foreign military presence is the exploitation of the Sahel's rich natural resources. He traced this exploitation back to the creation of the Common Organization of the Sahelian Region, OCRS, by France in 1957. This organization brought together parts of Mali, Burkina, Faso, Niger, Mauritania, and Algeria a region home to vast reserves of oil, uranium, gold, cobalt, diamonds, lithium, and other valuable resources. The minister stressed that the presence of these resources, including the world's largest water table, is the true reason for the Western military presence. But if this is true, what hope is there for African nations to benefit from their own natural wealth? Bazi shifted his focus to Africa's lack of representation in international bodies, particularly the UN Security Council. He questioned how the second largest continent by population, with 54 countries, could be denied a permanent seat on the council or veto power. This exclusion, he argued, is a state crime exacerbated by the West's continued paternalism and exploitation of Africa's wealth. In a powerful reminder of Africa's historical contributions, Bazi pointed out that Mali was the birthplace of the world's first human rights charter, the Kurukan Fuga in 1236. He condemned France for its arrogance towards Africa and highlighted the historical debt France owes to African soldiers who fought in both world wars. Bazi criticized African leaders for abandoning their cultural identities, arguing that they have allowed foreign influences to undermine their societies. He denounced Western attempts to impose values like homosexuality on African countries, declaring that such practices would never take root in Africa. But in an increasingly globalized world, can cultural isolation be maintained? In closing, Bazi highlighted the creation of the Partnership of the States of the Sahel, AES, a new framework for regional cooperation between Mali, Niger, and Burkina Faso. This partnership aims to secure their countries, develop their economies, and eradicate the influence of foreign powers. But can this alliance succeed where others have failed? Bazi's speech was a passionate defense of Africa's right to self-determination, its rich cultural heritage, and its immense untapped potential. He called on the world to recognize Africa's importance not as a playground for foreign interests, but as a continent with its own dignity, sovereignty, and future. As the echoes of Bazi's words fade from the UN Assembly Hall, the world is left to grapple with the hard truths he laid bare. Will this bold stance mark the beginning of a new era in African leadership, or will it lead to further isolation and conflict? One thing is certain. The global order has been shaken and there's no turning back. As we conclude this eye-opening journey through Burkina Faso's bold stance at the UN, we're left with profound questions about the future of global politics. 
Will this speech ignite a new era of African leadership? How will Western powers respond to these direct challenges? One thing is certain. The world order is shifting, and Africa's voice is growing stronger. Stay tuned as we continue to unravel the complexities of international relations in our ever-changing world.